Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, and we left off at verse uh, 10, verse 10. But let's review 7, 8, 9, all right? We left off at verse 10, but let's review verses 7, 8, and 9. Remember that in this chapter, there are two covenants going on. One is the Levitical law, and then the other one is what God calls a new covenant. Now, people are going to mistakenly think that this new covenant is referring to the church. It's referring to Christians. That is not true. It is a new covenant that is performed with Israel. A lot of people overlook that part. It is done with the nation of Israel. Why? Because God is not done with the Jews. He swore a unconditional uh, promise to Abraham that his physical seed will continue on a physical land grant. That has nothing to do with something spiritual or a spiritual group of people or a spiritual land. That's the reason why the Catholic Church was very infamous with this crusades. They're trying to build God's church, God's kingdom, because that's the land, promised land God has given to them, etc. It's totally off. So it's called a ki kingdom building gospel. The gospel of kingdom building is a bloody gospel that has caused untold suffering of millions. The Quran, the Muslims practice that as well. Uh, Calvinists and churches today, they preach about a kingdom gospel. In their mind, the kingdom gospel is basically building a kingdom on earth for Christians. That is totally false. That is totally false. You want to get out of that. You are not the physical nation of Israel. What you are is you are Christians. So Christians, they're different. The new covenant is applied to the nation of Israel. But we will see Christians applied as well. So in other words, it's going to be a double application. So the mistake is by hyper-dispensationalists who are mid-acts, as well as the non-dispensationalist, is that they only take a one-application approach. That shows their amateur Bible study. So, Bible-believing dispensationalists will see the double application. The New Covenant covers Israel as well as the Christian. So, we'll cover the Christian part soon when we reach chapter 9. But there is no doubt when we cover chapter 8, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way to 13, that is referring to Israel. No doubt, hands down, Israel. What's the evidence? The evidence is because of verse 8. He mentions it's toward the house of Judah and Israel. This definitely has to do with something national. This is not spiritual. Christians, our promise and our covenant is all done spiritually. It's a spiritual transaction. But this is a national thing. This is a national act. Look at verse 9. Notice right here, according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. That's their physical forefathers out of the land of Egypt. Well, they ain't Christians. That's referring to Jews. So we see that plainly. This is for the nation of Israel. Then we come across verse 10. Now, assuming that this is referring to Christians, what you're going to continually see is the logical fallacy or the impropriety of such a statement. It just doesn't make sense. When you see right here at verse 10, For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. So uh, God is speaking here. Now remember, I'm explaining each and every word. So if I'm explaining something, make sure to look at the verse and see if my explanations match up. So God is speaking here and he's saying that this, uh, this is a covenant that I, am, uh, that I will make in the future with Israel's house after what days? Those days. It's referring to sometime in the future. Sometime in the future after those days. He's going to uh, bring something to pass. We can guess it is a millennial kingdom. That's when God's going to restore the nation of Israel. So it's referring to a future timeline. We keep reading on 
I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Meaning that the Lord is speaking that when he gives the laws, the laws are not in tables of stone like last time. Remember, the Levitical law was written out. So it was written out like Moses' covenant. But it's not going to be these similar tables of stone again. What he's going to do is he's going to write them inwardly. So this is going to be an inward transaction that is done in the heart. So sometime in the millennial kingdom, they're going to be knowing God's law. See that? See the difference with these two pictures here? His laws are written inwardly in their heart, and this is different where it's done outwardly upon tables of stone or in writing. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, it's simple because it's the millennial kingdom. In other words, God is in charge. In the millennial kingdom, since God is in charge, he's going to do a lot of supernatural things that are not natural. So during the time of the Old Testament, we see a lot of natural things, uh, but this is going to be something supernatural now. He's going to put the laws in their mind. He's going to write them in their hearts. And because they have uh, the law of God in their minds and their hearts, those Jews are going to realize that God will be their God and that they are his people. So notice how the explanation matches up uh, with all the words in that verse. Notice in verse 11, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So these Jews are not going to be teaching their fellow brothers or their neighbors in the millennial kingdom Hey, no God. No, they're not going to do that. You know why? Because God's in charge of the kingdom. He's ruling over all the people. It's not like the time of the Old Testament where there were a bunch of people who didn't know God. It's not like the time of, see this, the Christians where people don't know God. So notice right here that this verse does not apply to Christians then. It's not the church age time period. It's talking about, it makes more sense, this time period. Why? Because I don't care how atheist you are, you're not going to be an atheist during that timeline. Because right. everyone's going to know the Lord. So that's why there's no need to tell anybody to know the Lord. There's no need to teach right doctrine. So no apostate Christian is going to foul up in their doctrine. They're not going to do some kind of charismatic spooky thing or believe some kind of Calvinist, you know, wrong doctrine. They're not going to believe that we... Uh, they're not going to believe, you know, the transubstantiation, Catholic mass. They're not going to get their doctrines messed up. They're, because God's going to write it in their mind and their heart because he's ruling over them, and he'll set them all straight. Amen. We don't have to set them straight. So we don't have to tell them to know the Lord that time. Uh, God says that everyone from the least to the greatest. So uh, no matter which class of people you are or what higher rank, lower rank you are, everyone's going to know. From the poor person to the richest person. Everyone's going to know. To the important leader, to the non-important citizen. If we look at Zechariah chapter 13, the command is even stronger. How strong, you might ask. So strong that if you were to dare say, this is what God said, and you were to preach to them, the Bible says at that millennial kingdom, you're going to be stabbed with a spear. You might say, wow, really? Yes, sir. The reason why God's going to do that is because how dare someone will speak for God when he's ruling over them and he can speak for himself and then he wrote all the laws in their hearts and minds and everything. That's right. See, so there's going to be no one there who's going to say, know the Lord or try to soul win. All right. There's no soul winning in the millennium. All right. Now, some of you soul winners love to soul win, but I'll tell you one thing. If you try to start soul winning in the millennium, you're going to get stabbed by God with a spear. All right? You might say, why is that? The reason why is because everybody will know. Everybody will know at that time, at the millennial kingdom. So look at Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. In that day, 
right? Kind of similar to Hebrews wording after those days. Usually when the Bible says that day, the day or something like that, you can tell it has to do with eschatology or some future timeline. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So notice that this sounds like the millennial kingdom. This is obviously, this obviously never happened in Old Testament. This obviously never happened in the church age. So this is for the millennial kingdom for Jews. Verse 3, look at this. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother, his very own parents that begat him, shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. That's how strict the millennial kingdom will be. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, why? Because... God wants no sin in the millennium. How you're going to live in the millennium is following his commandments because it's going to be a perfect kingdom. So you talk about military dictatorship right here. That's the only, you know how you're going to set this world straight? Believe it or not, it's not through democracy. All right, that's what we're called, rights of the people, lay out the sayings. Now, ideally, if without God, democracy is the best setup, I get it, but you still notice flaws with that system. It, costs, it still uh, rises up so much sin in our world. The best way you're going to stop it out is not through communism. You're not going to do it through a monarchy. Why? Because they're sinners. They're crooked. And talk about equality. No, it's not really equality. <laughs> Right over there. They hog it all for themselves while everybody starves and dies out in North Korea, right? So the point is that such a system won't work with man. There's military dictatorship can only work, can only work with the Lord Jesus Christ himself because he's holy, he's without sin, and he's eternal. When you go to a communist setup, a military dictatorship setup, a monarchy setup, you have to, even if you're a beneficial ruler, you're going to die. And the next guy who takes over might not be as beneficial as you. And people are also, this is a, a matter of fact statement, when people are used to the former boss, it takes getting used to, to a newer boss. Right. Same thing with a pastor. And if a newer pastor takes over, it takes some getting used to. Yeah. So there's always problems. But when you get an eternal being, see, no problems. No problem. See, this is the best setup. The best that setup is Jesus Christ being king. So that's the reason why Amen. the best way you, you want to solve crime. I'll tell you how to solve crime. Have Jesus Christ in charge and follow yes. his commandments. Amen. No sin, no drinking, no legalization of marijuana, no <clears throat> marriage, you know, and beep, 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 and all this kind of stuff going on in our liberal propaganda world nowadays. All right, get rid of all of that. Oh, you're so strict. You, know, you don't know what strict is, man. When God rules in the millennial kingdom, you get stabbed, buddy. You get stabbed. Well, it sounds like Khalifa. It sounds like the Muslim nation, what they're trying to do. Yeah, see what their nation is doing. They're not thriving. And everything's so messed up over there. You know why? Because they don't have God ruling over. They don't have the Lord Jesus Christ ruling over the system. They got a messed up book where a bunch of women are being oppressed in such a system. How about that? So no, this is way different from a caliphate or a Quran system, kingdom. This is a sinless, eternal being Amen. who will never do wrong. Amen. And he stamps out sin with the rod of iron. That's the best way. That's the best way that you can get the job done. So if you want peace on earth, goodwill to men, if you want a garden of Eden on this earth, if you want a successful so-called United Nations, then give up your rule and have Jesus Christ rule. That's it. They, they refuse to, see? So then you are eating up your own sin. What we got in America is truly what we deserve. That's right. That's right. All right? Try all you might spending billions of dollars, all right? Yeah, I'm preaching at them. Spend billions of dollars, waste all your time in higher ed. You're just wasting your time, buddy. 
And even the majority of you know it, which is why the majority of you are fighting against global warming. Because the majority of you know that you're all going to die out eventually. I'm playing at their field now. See? So all of you know that who are watching. All of you unbelievers. So the best thing is you get an eternal God. All right? Simple. That's it. Go by his rules, his domain. Why is everyone offended and mad? Go back. Hebrews 8. You know why you're offended and mad? You got a lot of pride in you. That's your problem. You got a lot of pride in you. You want to rule the kingdom. You don't want God to rule. All right, Hebrews chapter 8. So think about this. That's why it makes sense that cannot be the Christian. Now, there are some anti-dispensationalists who are trying to use Hebrews chapter 8, and they're saying, well, this is referring to Christians, but it said Israel. It said house of Judah, house of Israel. No, that's referring to Christians. It still don't make sense. So then there was one Bible-believing preacher who pointed out, well, then, uh, do you believe in soul winning? Yeah, I believe in soul winning. Right here, you're supposed to get killed if you do soul winning. You're not supposed to do soul winning. And that anti-dispensationalist coward, he just said, oh, I don't know, I don't know, and stuff like that. Then he gets betrayed by his own anti-dispensational friends. He gets bullied by them. And then, you know, now he's betrayed by them, and he still sticks to their beliefs. You know, you know what that is? That's like an abused victim. So that anti-dispensationalist guy became a victim. To this day, he's still against anti-dispensationalism, even though he's attacked by his anti-dispensational friends. How about that? That's sad. That's sad. That's, what, that's why wrong doctrine is so serious. Uh, what will control people's... Uh, what can control people very powerfully, sometimes more than the lust of flesh, is a strong belief or strong conviction. Think about it. Uh, why is it that no matter how corrupt the leaders are in the liberal system today, that uh, they'll still vote in or want the kind of uh, messed up officials that they want? You ever thought about that? They don't care about their resume or their messed up history. They'll still want that person. Why? Because it lines up with their beliefs, their convictions. If you uh, support somebody's convictions, you will get their support no matter how messed up you are. That's extremely powerful that the devil used. There's a truth to that one too. Y'all are in church not because of Gene Kim. It's because of right doctrines, right? See, doctrine is so powerful because what we're looking after is not people, it's for truth, right? So think about it. See, those liberals, they think they got the truth. So they're willing to do riots or s lose their testimony, be stupid, act evil, because, and no matter how much they're shown plainly how wrong they are, how evil they are, they will still live and die that way because of their beliefs. The same thing with the right-wingers too, you know? I mean, you can pull up uh, dirt on Trump's life or anybody, politician's life, but Fox News will still remain Fox News in its conservative status, no matter how many Republicans' uh, dirty life stories you pull up. Why is that? That's their belief. That's what their belief is founded upon. Billions of dollars are founded upon. See that? It's all about beliefs. So the devil knows how powerful that is, so he wants to use it the wrong way to control people. The thing about you and I how we are prevented from that is we need to critically examine beliefs and find the right belief. That way we know we're in the safe place. That's the best thing to do. All right then. Now let's go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 8. But that's a nugget that I've give, given to you. What controls people is beliefs, believe it or not. Everybody has that. Beliefs are what control people. So they'll vote in the kind of people that you wouldn't think that they would vote in. Because why? It lines up with their belief and they don't care. Okay, so uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 8 and then uh, we'll look at verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Amen. So God promised to the nation of Israel he's going to be merciful to them concerning how unrighteous they are and their sins and iniquities, he's going to erase it all. He's no longer going to remember them. Now notice that this wording matches to a T with probably the strongest New Testament passage. 
uh, supporting the nation of Israel as God's chosen people is Romans 11. Mm -hmm. Romans 11. It all lines up. Go to Romans chapter 11. And then uh, for good measure, let's go to Daniel 9. Just one good measure. Let's go to Daniel 9. Why don't you go to Daniel 9 and Romans chapter 11. Now, before people think that the New Testament Christian church replaced the nation of Israel, notice that Paul didn't think so. Even when he admitted, even when he admitted the Christian church replaced the Jews spiritually, not physically as a nation, only spiritually, Paul recognized that physically that they are still God's chosen people, that God will return to them, that God will restore them. Yeah. All right, so we're going to see this. Now, I've said this several times, but it bears repeating again on this study. Let's go to uh, Daniel chapter 9 first. And then I want you to look at Daniel 9 verse 24. Daniel 9 verse 24. Why do you believe the tribulation is uh, that the Christians are not going through that? Well, it's pretty simple because the tribulation is reserved for the nation of Israel. Yeah. It's not for Christians. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. You see that? You see that? It is a physical place, a physical location, and that's obviously not Christians because we didn't exist that time. So he's saying to Daniel that your, Israel, uh, your Jewish people that I put a clock there where they can fulfill, they can finish up their sin. See, this is a national clock that God was talking about at Hebrews chapter 8 then, when he's going to erase their iniquities. It's referring to a national forgiveness, national sins. It has nothing to do with an individual sin. It has nothing to do with an uh, individual who wants to become a saved Christian and there's a spiritual transaction that washes away sin. That has nothing to do with that. This is a holistic nation. Yeah. So let's keep reading. And to make an end of sin. See that? And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now notice right here that God promised this to the Jewish people. Now, does it take you, according to verse 24, 70 weeks long to finish your sins? Or do you believe when you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, it was instantaneous? Amen. Instantaneous, on the spot. Then this verse has no application to you. This takes 70 weeks long for the nation of Israel. So notice that this is no doubt a national transaction. If you keep reading on, this is totally different. Uh, you see right here, Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks long. The only verse that will mention about the tribulation being seven years is Daniel 9, 27, the one week. And that one week is referring to the context of verse 24, the 70th week out of the 70 weeks there. It's the last week out of there. So notice that week then is for who? Verse 24 again, 70 weeks, which includes the tribulation then, right? are what? Determined upon thy people. That's not for Christians. They're determined upon the nation of Israel. So the nation of Israel, they're going through the tribulation. The tribulation is a time which is described as Jacob's trouble. Yeah. See, that's in Jewish wording there. Yeah. And why is it their trouble, not our trouble? The reason why is because we get raptured. We're not here. Yeah. And the Jews, they have to go through the tribulation because they have to pay for their national sins. See, that's the problem with uh, people watching online nowadays. They're like, well, I can't believe that Jews are God's chosen people because they're so wicked and they got so many sin issues. You're right. That's why they have to go through this sin cleansing program, this punishment program. Wow. It's that simple. Amen. It's that simple. Amen. All right. So why do you have a hard time believing that? God already promised that in the Old Testament. Old Testament. All right. So that debunks the uh, people who talk about Christians going through tribulation and Christians replacing Israel and that Jews are so evil so they can't be God's chosen people. No, it debunks all three of those heresies, actually. Now, when you go to Romans 11, go to Romans 11. This is New Testament Christian doctrine that Paul preaches. And you know what New Testament Christian doctrine is? 
God will restore the nation of Israel. That's, that's New Testament Christian doctrine. Look at Romans chapter 11. Notice verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So don't be ignorant, but how many who claim themselves to be truthers online are ignorant? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. How many people online think that I'm a truther, I have so much knowledge. I'm, they're wise in their own conceit. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until the Gentiles time period is up. Now we're right now under the time period of Gentiles. God's no longer using his time clock on Israel. Because remember, Israel has been cast aside, right? Their nation has been lost for over a millennia. So God casts the Israel nation off, and he's currently focusing on Gentile nations. Yes. That's the reason why Christians are able to come in. Christian doctrine comes in. Because we're spreading the gospel in different Amen. nations. Amen. See that? Because God is focusing on Gentile nations. But you notice how the nations, or a.k.a. United Nations is rejecting God. So God is about to give up on them now and go back to the Jewish nation again. So until his time period with Gentiles is fulfilled, then uh, he's going to return to Israel. Verse 26, notice right here, and so all Israel shall be saved. Obviously, that doesn't mean every individual. This makes more sense. It's a national speaking context. It's a national context, a holistic context, context. So the nation of Israel will be saved. As it is written, there shall see future. So we know that's referring to the millennium then, in the future after the tribulation. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall, notice right here, turn away ungodliness from Jacob. See that? Doesn't that match Hebrews 8? God's going to take away their unrighteousness, their sins and iniquities. And that was his new covenant to them, right? Look at verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them. Not you Christians. This is Jew. This is written in New Testament Christian doctrine. He said that he even admitted that covenant is for Jews. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. See, that's proof that Israel is not Christian because Paul distinguished right here. They're not the same as us who believe in the Christian gospel. So take it or leave it. Christians are not the new Israel. No, Paul distinguished them right here. doesn't make any sense. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 8, Hebrews chapter 8. So the clock for some people who are curious about that it's going like this. The idea is, remember, this is the Old Covenant here. So I'm going to draw a line over here. This is Old Testament. Then Jesus died on the cross. Then after that, we hit the New Testament. Now, the New Testament is what we're covering right here. That's when we're covering about the new covenant. Now, testament is different co from covenant, but over here, I'm just going to treat it simultaneous for now, okay? That way, no one gets lost. But here, we're in the New Testament. In this New Testament, it covers two parts right here. One for Israel, one for Christians. Why is that? Because right here, it's not just one time period that goes in smoothly all the way to the end. No, no. There's a rapture here. So, because there's a rapture, there is the church age here. Amen. Church age, then rapture, Amen. then you go to tribulation. Yep. Then after the tribulation, pretty much a uh, majority of biblical uh, theologians will uh, admit that there is the millennium. So... That's a no-brainer here. So millennium, 1,000 years, will go down here afterwards. Because of that, remember, tribulation is reserved 
For who? According to Daniel 9, 24. Jews, right? So Jews are here. Church age is obvious. It's obviously not physical Jews. It's referring to Christians, right? Pretty much any denomination will agree in that one. So notice in this new covenant era, it's two people. See that? There's double application right here. So we haven't covered this part yet. So y'all are curious about that, I'm sure. But right now we're covering this part. So this is the new covenant that God promised because the old covenant right here doesn't work. It's null and void. So then the new covenant right here is what's going to last forever and work. So when we look at Hebrews 8, the last verse over there mentions that. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13, In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Notice Paul said right here that uh, God mentioned that he made a new covenant and the first one is old and that's decaying and that's uh, increasing. That's what waxeth mean. Waxeth is usually a word that means increase that has to do with time. That's getting older. Waxeth old, and it's about to disappear. Now, notice right here, another interesting statement. When we get to biblical hermeneutics, Paul says right here, ready to vanish away. Not that it's completely vanished away. Then that means the Old Testament, uh, some of the operations that are going on with Jews was still ongoing. Some of you might wonder, why is that? The reason why uh, it was still operating, still ongoing. Now, don't get me wrong. When Jesus died on the cross, he ended the Old Testament. We're getting to New Testament. But even though that official time period is what marked end of Old Testament, beginning of New Testament, he still allowed some transition to remain. So it's dying here, all right? Old Testament did end. But when it ended, it's in a dying phase. Does that make sense? That's why there's still a little bit of that transition. The book of Acts is a what? Transitional book. It's transitional. Meaning then, it makes a lot of sense where God was still dealing with the Jews. Remember, it was uh, during the time of Acts, it was transitioning from Jews to who? Gentiles, right? It's not like God said, I cut off Jews, I go to Gentiles. No, he said that several times, meaning that he didn't cut the, the Jews off completely yet. He was going to. He was going to. Because he was still merciful to the Jews. So the Jews were dying out, but the Gentiles were being increasing. They were being turned over more. Because of that transitional time period, that's the reason why there are Jewish dealings still ongoing at that time the author was writing. So during the time of the author, if it's true that it's Paul who wrote it during his years in Arabia before he gave the Christian gospel more clearly to the Gentiles, he was in that transitional era where it was still dealing with Jews. So remember that there's going to be Jewish doctrines mingled here with the Gentiles who are receiving Christian doctrine. That's another thing to keep in mind. So just because the new one's coming in, it didn't mean that uh, the old one, that there was no transitioning. As that verse says, it was ready to decay. It's ready to vanish. That's important to keep in mind. That's important to keep in mind. So that's a verse that can help concerning transitions in dispensations. So I will uh, write down over here, Jew to Gentile. Jew to Gentile. During this transitional era. It's also possible, if he's, uh, because he is speaking to Jews here, right, in Hebrews chapter 8, when he's saying the old is ready to die, the new is coming in, that it's very possible that this church age could have been bypassed then. 
if the Jews accepted their Messiah, then it would look more like this. A lot of dispensationalists accurately draw the church age as a bracket, not as a part of the official timeline. But it's more like a bracket. Because notice right here, this whole other timeline is Jews. But over here, we got in. Why did we get in? Because the Jews rejected their Messiah. So this is a what-if scenario. What if Jews accepted? Then see that? Then this would be merely a bracket then. That's important to understand. Yeah, it is actually pretty scary because then we would probably go, where would we be, right? Where would we be? So the simple answer to that one, we got it. The Christian church age gospel, amen. That's why Paul said in Romans 11 that the fall of the Jews was our salvation. That's why he mentioned that, amen. Praise the Lord for that one. Now, uh, this is not to say that uh, if the Jews accepted the Messiah, that God was unfair to Gentiles. No, Gentiles, they still will have a chance to get saved, but they would have to follow then Israel's setup rather than their own setup. But God made an own setup for the Gentiles where they don't have to follow all the Jewish ordinances. So that's the thing to understand. All right, so it is much easier, right? Amen, it is much easier, yeah. But how many Gentiles are trying to act like Jews doing it the hard way still? Isn't that amazing? You know, Seventh-day Adventists trying to act like, you know, Jews and then black Hebrew Israelites acting like Jews and then everybody trying to act like a Jew. It's just crazy now. Even the Catholic Church, you know, even though they don't have Jewish ordinances, they have their own ordinances. They just do it the hard way. Why do people want to do it? Why do people want to do it the hard way? It makes you wonder. Don't people prefer the easy way? I'll tell you the answer. It doesn't matter which way God chooses. Mankind just does not want to go God's way. It's that simple. He can make it so easy for you, you'd still hate it because it's God's way, not your way. All right, chapter 9, Amen. chapter 9, and then verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So the author is saying, so certainly this first covenant, the Old Testament right here, had ordinances. It also had the rules, the regulations that were divine, that were holy in service. So we can guess the Levitical priesthood. They had so many rituals, regulations. Those were considered to be holy. They also had their own sanctuary, and it's an earthly one. That's what worldly sanctuary means. It means something that's earthly of this world. Verse 2, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. The author is describing uh, this, sa this worldly sanctuary, and he says that the tabernacle, and he calls it the first. When this tabernacle was created, the first thing was considered to be the holy place. They have two places in the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, so it's kind of like a tent during that time, during Moses' time period. In this tent, it's, it's a crummy tent, but just put up with it. <laughs> in the tabernacle, they have two locations here. The two locations are the holies and then the holy of holies. The holy place and then the holy of holies. Okay, here we go. So with one and two, the author is describing the first. You notice that in the verse? The first. Candlestick, show, uh, the showbread, and then uh, the table, and etc. This is uh, inaccurate candlestick, but I'm just going to draw it anyway. That way people can understand what's going on right here. All right. And then there's the showbread, obviously. All right. So there's a lot of things in this uh, worldly sanctuary, the Bible calls it, meaning it's all earthly. Continuing onwards about the items inside the tabernacle, the Bible says, verse 3, and after the second veil, so now we're coming to the second location, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So there's a veil to the second place. 
And this part of the tabernacle is called Holy of Holies, or the author calls it Holiest of All. What is this Holiest of All location described as in verse 4? Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Okay, so inside the Holy of Holies, it had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. This Ark of the Covenant was overlaid or completely laid out, completely covered uh, all the way around it with gold everywhere. And inside that Ark of the Covenant was a golden pot. The golden pot contained manna that the Jews were eating. It also had Aaron's rod. For some of you who know the story, Aaron's dead stick gave birth to some flowers. And the tables of the covenant. So those are the, the Ten Commandments that we see right here. The tables of the covenant. Continuing on, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. In verse 5, he points out right here that the Ark of the Covenant had above it basically two cherubims of glory, and they were covering the mercy seat. So you'll notice that right here, uh, but this is more of heaven itself. In the Ark of the Covenant, the wings are actually covering that mercy seat itself. And the mercy seat is obviously where God is sitting. But notice right here, the last part of verse 5, Paul says, if he's the author, this part we cannot really speak right now, specifically. So he can't give specifics about this place. That shows how very holy this place is. Now, why did Paul say that? Because of the real thing of what's going on over here. If Paul's the author, this one makes sense which I believe Paul is the author here, it matches well with 2 Corinthians 12. He said the same thing. When he went to heaven, he said, I cannot speak of the things that are up there. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. Notice that the things up in heaven are not to be described or told. The Bible says, How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Wow, so up in heaven, you're not supposed to speak such words describing the third heaven or paradise itself. It's not lawful. God doesn't want it. That's why it makes sense when we go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you describe this thing, you cannot do it because it's just too wonderful. That's the idea. It's just way too wonderful that perhaps people, when they try to talk about it as best as they could, it could be something illegal, something bad could happen to them. You just don't know. Or it's just too holy. That's how wonderful it is. That's how glorious it is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Man, that makes you excited about heaven because verse 9 says... But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Your imagination can't describe this. Not even your own imagination. The best thing that uh, you see of man's vivid imaginations on it are video games now. So they always try to do fantasy realms and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Why are kids so much into that? Why are people so much into that? You know why? Because of those pictures. Because of those pictures, they're very catchy. They're very beautiful. That's why people are into those movie stuff that describe those fantasy or sci-fi realms. Why? People want to see some imaginary realm. But what they conjured up? is barely scratching the surface of what God conjured up over there. Now, here's the thing. This is an extremely interesting side note. You notice those sons of God, if they were the ones who built those pyramids in Egypt, if they were the ones where remnants of the Nephilim 
perhaps carried it on to parts of Asia, North America, South America, pyramid type structures? Why is it that all these towers and pyramids have to align really well with the stars? The Stonehenge, for example, how they try to line it up with the sun and the heavens itself. I mean, it's crazy how they built that. When you look at that, I mean, it's like a huge slab of stone and then it's like it's got its own uh, lock over there. Uh, you'll see that at the watch night service, we'll show you. But it's got, it's, it's got like some kind of lock over there where another stone can just snap on top of it like a Lego or something. That was so weird, man. The only way that you can do that is that if there's a really big guy who puts this block here and then another block on top of it like that. That would make the most sense, actually. To hear them talk about evolutionary processes, natural processes, is so laughable. Like me and the missionary are just looking at each other going like, you know, and just <laughs> like that, you know. Just so funny. There was no doubt. When I look at that, it makes way more sense. It's more logical that a giant would do that. The distance and everything, it just makes a lot more sense. But even if uh, people were to build that, I believe that people got the knowledge from those sons of God, from those giants themselves, from the remnants of the Nephilim. Think about this. Why are they infatuated with heaven that much? Why are they trying to build stuff that would look like heaven? You ever thought about that? This is my theory, all right? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I think this. I do believe Lucifer, he did go to heaven. He had access to heaven. But what I believe is this. After his fall, then there's that sea of glass that blocked it. And so when Lucifer talks to God in heaven, he can only talk to him through this sea of glass. That sea of glass distorts the real view of heaven. After his fall, I believe that because Jesus Christ said at John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If, I, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, that heaven that Lucifer went to before is not the same heaven right now. I think the Lord is building a more fantastic heaven for us. So it makes so much sense that those sons of God, <laughs> see, they get so infatuated with that. That's why they're building stuff to somehow align to it. It would make a lot more sense to me that way. It also makes sense to me about Lucifer's statement. That's all he ever wanted was to become God and live in this beautiful place. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. And notice the language here that is described as building high stuff. He would love towers. He would love pyramids, something that would align to the heavens. That's what you see mankind doing right now. They boast about their tallest skyscrapers, their buildings and whatnot, launching out satellites, whatever, whatnot. So they're all boasting about that, but that's a Luciferian spirit in there. Now, I'm not against anyone who wants to build a tall building, all right? Don't get me wrong on that one. But you have to realize that at you have to realize that sometimes when they do that, what kind of spirit is leading them to do that, right? Is there some spirit involved that would make them so infatuated with that? So there are times that can happen. So look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? See, God kicked him out of heaven. He loves that place. Look at verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. He really wants to hit up there, guys. He's not content with here on earth. Do you understand that? He's not content with that. He wants to make you content with this earth more than heaven. Yeah, thou preach, amen, bless God. Right? He's trying to make you more worldly-minded than heavenly-minded. But I'll tell you what, Satan is more heavenly-minded than you worldly-minded Christians. Thou will preach, altar call, open up altar call. Yeah. I, man, I hope the devil won't attack me after this. But the thing is this, is that you notice right here that the devil is so heavenly minded right here. He, that's all he ever wants. You and I, we're content with this world. And the devil's like, you can have it. I don't care. 
I give it to whomsoever I will, he says, right? Look at Isaiah 14, 12. He says right here, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's a Luciferian mentality is to try to get up there in heaven. Why wouldn't God speak the words? What if Lucifer found out more? What if he tries to imitate? And he is. He's trying to build his own heaven on earth. We see pyramids, Stonehenge, all that kind of stuff. I think the Antichrist, just my own theory, when he rules, he's going to build up heaven on earth somehow. He's going to build his millennial kingdom that will picture heaven on earth. But anyway, we see that Satan, he doesn't, in my theory, he doesn't even know what's really up there. So then that's the reason why he wants you to not know as much as you can and make you lose as much heaven as possible when you get up there. Now in this sea of glass, he sees only a distorted view. But that distorted view is enough for make him to go, whoa. And he's trying to make copycats of it, of those distortions. So what he's building here are simply distortions of heaven. Wow. Anyway, it's all my theory. You know, if I'm heresy, it's heresy. Go back to Hebrews 8, you know. I, I know. If it's heresy, it's heresy. <laughs> I could probably do a deep, deep teaching investigating that one. That would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. But that's what I think. Uh, in my opinion, I think that that is very, very likely. That is very, very likely, which makes a lot of sense of the devil's activities, his temptations on us, how he attacks us, how he wants us to be worldly minded than heavenly minded. Uh, it's in scripture that where we see Satan is infatuated with heaven itself. And then historically, archaeologically speaking, we see so many of Luciferian remnants trying to match up heaven all the stinking time. And you just don't know why. <laughs> Amen, brother. Go to Hebrews chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse 6, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. And that wasn't the deep doctrine yet. Oh, boy, I don't know if I'll make that. Okay. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. All right, so let me explain all those verses the, uh, and see if my explanations match up. So notice that verse 6, the author is saying, so when God ordained all these things, regulations, Levitical practices, the priest had to follow those regulations and practices by going inside the first tabernacle, which is the first part of the tabernacle, the holy, uh, the holy place, the showbread, the candlestick, and all that, where they had to uh, accomplish God's service, do their work. Verse 7, in the second place, the holiest of all, of the tabernacle, the high priest is the only one who could go inside there. And he can only go once a year. That's how sacred the place was. And he had to go with blood. He had to carry the blood with him because he was human. He's not uh, infallible. So he had to have that blood, that innocent blood of lambs for the forgiveness of sins with him to cover him. And he offered those animal sacrifices and received that blood for himself. And he did that for the errors of his own pe uh, the people that he took care of. Look at verse 8. The Holy Ghost, he did all of that to symbolize, to signal something, to represent something. Basically, the way, the entrance into the holiest of all, the Holy of Holies, was not yet shown. Wait a minute, what does that mean? Then that means that the holiest place the high priest went into was only a picture of the real holiest place that was not yet shown. It's not talking about this holiest place. Otherwise, then uh, the verse is contradicting itself. The high priest was able to get inside there 
because it was already shown to him. So it was simply a picture of this. Again, matching up the theory. Things that they built on earth are merely copycats, imitations of heaven itself. It wasn't shown. It wasn't revealed yet. The tabernacle was picturing heaven. God gave him a pattern about how to build the tabernacle that pictured heaven itself. Let's see right here, continuing on. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So ever since that time that when the Bible says the first tabernacle, this time he's referring to this one versus this one, which is the second tabernacle. That's what he's trying to drive at right here. So he's saying that the, if you look at that verse, the first tabernacle was still standing when the actual holiest place was not yet shown. So then that makes a lot more sense. He's basically saying during the time that Moses' tabernacle was still ongoing, that there was a second tabernacle up there that wasn't shown yet. Do we follow so far? So we notice right here that the explanations match up. If we continue on, verse 9, and this is more plain, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. Meaning then that this first tabernacle, my interpretation of it, uh, was correct before. This whole thing is a figure. It's a uh, picture for the real thing. And everything that the priest did, like going in once a year, having the blood, all of that was a figure. It was a picture for this present time, for this present time, where the... Gifts and sacrifices were offered on the altar by the priest. And those gifts and sacrifices that were offered made the high priest or the priest service perfect. It perfected him. And then con pertaining to the conscience or conscience wise. Because that proves then during the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, they, they knew if they were to judge their works by their conscience, that, man, I don't know if I'm good enough. Yeah. I know I'm definitely not perfect. That's why people in the Old Testament, they couldn't go to heaven after they died, and their salvation was different from ours. Their salvation was by works, and because it wasn't perfect, they couldn't go to heaven, but to down on earth, which is uh, referring to Abraham's bosom. But that's a, that's a doctrine I already taught you before. I'm not going to get into that right now. When we continue onward here in verse 10, all those things stood for a fact. It basically represented only through the means of all these physical stuff. It's all physical stuff. That's how they represent it. Like the, the stuff that they ate, the stuff that they drank. Every time they had different types of washing or hygiene procedures. And then also any other fleshly or physical rule that they had. And these were all imposed on those Levitical priests until the time of Reformation. That is referring uh, to the time when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, there are two, uh, there's another place. I want you to go to Acts chapter 3, I believe. Acts chapter 3. The time of Reformation is different from the time of refreshing. Again, the time of Reformation is different from the time of refreshing. Time of Reformation is where Jesus died on the cross. So he can reform. He changed the Old Testament system where people can come to the cross for salvation. Amen. Now, remember, Hebrews is addressed to uh, Jews in the tribulation. So if it's referring to them, then these Jews had to come to the blood of the cross, and remember they had to keep washing themselves in the blood of the Lamb. That had to be done through their faith and works. That was already explained in previous chapters in Hebrews. Because the Jews rejected their Messiah, hence the tribulation didn't start 
Remember, the Christians got that one. So Gentiles. So then the Christians, how they can go through the cross is simply by putting their faith in it. Because they put their faith in it, no works are required for that one. So that's the time of Reformation. Time of refreshing is referring to the millennial kingdom here. The millennial kingdom is known as the time of refreshing because God is going to refresh the nation of Israel. See, he makes them anew. So this is the time of refreshing. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 3. Notice that Peter talked about their Messiah coming down on the earth again. So that is definitely millennial kingdom when he's setting up to rule. But then he describes it as time of refreshing. Verse 19, verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ unto you. Uh, shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. That's Old Testament promise Amen. that they will have their Messiah again. There's no doubt this is millennial application right here, times of refreshing. And then uh, the deepest doctrine that I didn't know, I wasn't able to cover, but we'll cover that at our next Hebrew study. But you notice right here, the blood of Jesus Christ, it's spreading all over here and it's somehow stuck over here. Yeah. How does that work? Next time. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, increased our knowledge of the scriptures and every word out of that King James Bible so that we could read it for ourselves, gave us more of the right approaches dispensationally, doctrinally, practically. And uh, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.